Okay, I guess it actually started. Huh. I didn't even press start. Uh, Might have just started on your time clock, so. Yeah, I, I still have a half a minute on my clock, but uh, well, hmm. let's see. For anybody who's on the, uh, the call right now that can hear us speaking, um, I want you to know that you can go to the questions if you've got a question. Go down to your control panel and look where it says questions. So if you've got something, and anybody who can hear me right now, just type in, yes, I hear you. So I know that uh, you guys are on. Anybody that's on can do it. Yes, I hear, okay, okay, Dave, okay, Steve, great. Okay, guys, so it is seven o'clock and we are going to start uh, right on time. Uh, I just mentioned to the guys who uh, are on the line that, um, if you have a question, just uh, type it in under questions. I'll try to get to them uh, as I can. But uh, Will uh, Colton is going to be talking right now, and he's going to do us a little bit about risk management uh, uh, for Inspector Pro and how it relates to home inspections. And then after that, Eric will uh, do his presentation. So uh, without any messing around, uh, Will, uh, welcome to the Great Lakes chapter, and um, go ahead and start. Thrilled to be here. The weather is a lot nicer in my office than it probably is in the Great Lakes right now. Um, so it, I don't really love the webinar thing because I don't get to see you guys in person and have a real presentation. I, that's what I prefer to do, but uh, my wife prefers that I don't travel. So so this is good. But I'll try to keep it fairly brief. Uh, Frank's given me about 15 minutes. Uh, answering any questions that you guys have is far more important than than getting through my slides. I have more slides than I need, and I will stop um, after uh, the basic presentation and just leave it open for about five minutes to, to have questions. If we don't have questions, I'll have one more claim example to share with you if you want. Um, but those of you who don't know me, I mean, I'm sure I've got several clients in the in the room, or, the, or at least Inspector Pro does, but uh, I've done ENO and GL for almost 15 years now. Uh, I was one of two people that was here when we created the program and we took it from being a, a policy that was for draw inspectors for construction draw inspections to being a full home inspection policy. And the policy has adapted and evolved significantly since then. Um, we're currently Inspector Pro's the, the number one ENO and GO provider to home inspectors in the entire nation. Um, and we deal with more claims and more crazy situations than any of our competitors. In fact, maybe more than all of them combined. Uh, and so we've learned a lot over the years. If somebody would have told me 15 years ago that my career was going to be dedicated to mostly one group of individuals and those individuals were be, gonna be home inspectors, I think it was silly, but uh, I know way more about home inspection and about home inspection insurance than I, than I probably want to most days. Um, this is what I look like in a suit. Uh, I don't have to wear one very often, which is good, but there's my contact info. I'll share that again at the end. Uh, I'm a relationship-based salesperson. So I'm going to shamelessly show you one of my greatest accomplishments in, in my entire life, and that's my family. Um, I married one of the most wonderful people in the world, and we have four very energetic boys. They're, they're handsome, they're healthy, they're very hungry. Um, and our method is really just to wear them out and then refuel them again. We do a lot of outdoor activity, mountain biking, hiking, boating. My boys play a lot of soccer, some basketball and football. Um, but when you got four boys like mine, you got to keep them moving or they'll drive you crazy. Um, but that's, that's what I like to talk about most of the time. But we'll talk about insurance today. Um, here's my disclaimer. I'm not an attorney. You guys are going to have some legal questions. Uh, and I ha I'm going to have some answers, but those answers can vary by state. And I'm not an attorney, so I don't want you to take it as, as full legal advice. To keep it really basic, I have six risk management tips. The first of those is your pre-inspection contract. Now, I have talked about pre-inspection contracts and agreements for, for well over 10 years now. And I've heard every question and objection under the sun. When I talk about pre-inspection agreements, I can tell you one, it's paramount that you have one. And the second part of that is it must be properly executed. By properly executed, I mean you must get that contract signed prior to starting your inspection, not before re returning the report, not after you've completed the inspection, prior to. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. 
The first one is in, a, in almost every state, that contract is not enforceable if they have to sign the agreement after you have started the service or after you have completed the service. Any signature that happens after you've completed in the inspection can be construed as that client having to sign that agreement under duress and it gets thrown out of court all day long. So if you have a legal issue there, that plaintiff attorney will just argue that their client had to sign under duress, had to sign it to get the, get the report that they were gonna pay for, all of those things. So make sure that it's signed prior to starting your inspection. The second reason, other than it being enforceable, is that all the e &O insurance policies, if you're carrying e &O, almost every single one of them has a clause in there that they can decline coverage if you don't have it executed properly. And the, and the policies will outline what that means. They will say prior to, before commencing the inspection, all of those things. So be sure if you want your coverage to be in place, if you want proper defense by a contract when you're in court, get it signed and get it signed prior to the inspection. Number two is concise reporting. Uh, the examples will get into this a little bit, but report to your SOP and report clearly and concisely. Concise is an intentionally chosen word here because it means comprehensive and brief. Be straightforward and, and clear. Number three, photos, photos, photos. Um, in managing the risk and in responding to client, client complaints, photos work wonders for us. I'm going to introduce you to my my third son. His name is Jones, and he's a bit of a celebrity in the in the neighborhood that I live in. I had a neighbor who was a photographer, who um, a professional photographer, Forbes magazines, uh, done all sorts of photo shoots with celebrities and sports professionals and all of those things. He sat my son in front of a camera, and he'd been telling me for years. He was about two when he started telling me. In these pictures, he's four, um, but that he wanted to put him in front of the lens. And he put him in front of a lens to test the new light, said nothing to him, and, and he took 180 something shots. And there was more than 150 unique faces made by my, my four-year-old. He's a character, and my, my professional photographer friend told me I, he'd never had anybody be able to make that much of a variety of faces in anybody he'd ever photographed. Um, so if you remember anything, take some photos. If Jones helps you remember, well, then that's good too. Okay, communication. We'll go into that in the first example that I'm going to give you. But communication is huge, and I don't mean, I mean prior to the inspection, during the during the inspection, after the inspection. The communication that you have with your clients and the open manner in which you do it will help you when they have a complaint. They will come to you before they hire an attorney. Um, you need to make sure to communicate professionally. Communicate like an adult is what I always say. Um, I had a home inspection attorney tell me that you need to. You need to communicate like you're talking to a fifth or sixth grade educated human being most of the time. And I think you can do that in a in a in an elementary manner without being disrespectful. So be professional and communicate in a way that everybody can understand. Number five is pretty simple: release of liability. You guys have probably heard of that. It's a form that you have your client sign whenever you return a an inspection fee, maybe in a complaint, uh, or anything of value that you give back to your client in a complaint process, be sure you get that release of liability. They handle they, they stand up really well in court. Also, if if you don't have one, I'll give you that email of mine again, and I've got some samples that I'll send you. Whether you're my client or not, you can have a copy of that release. It's a really good thing. Number six, and I won't go too far into it, but tools and technology that exist today, um, I think they're valuable. Um, these are things that are in many ways beyond your standards of practice and scope of inspection. Maybe a drone, maybe your thermal imaging camera, maybe your uh, moisture meter. These are tools that can help you verify your expertise or your assumptions with the evidence that you're seeing. They're not to be used as Bible, um, but they are great tools to verify those things. And I know all the limitations to uh, Moisture meters giving false positives, and if you're using a thermal, you need to make sure you've got proper training. Uh, I wouldn't ever tell somebody to use a drone in place of walking the roof if you can if you can safely manage and and walk the roof. That's the best way to do it. Even though it may be beyond your standards, it will help you in the risk management end of things. Okay. Uh, before I go into this, any any questions from you guys? Uh, yes, one question. If uh, I damage a garage uh, door closure when testing the impact reverse, do I have to be 
or no? Do I have to be sued by the owner before my insurance company will cover the damage? Or can I just ask my insurance company to cover the cost of repair? Well, darn it, I chose the wrong example because I have a garage door repair example and the testing the thing. But um, the truth of the matter is I have people handle it in many ways. Uh, you're not necessarily liable. You're obligated to do that test if you're doing it. And if the damage is caused, you've discovered a defect. So that's the first thing. If you don't want to pay for it, there is a fight that can be had and a logical fight that can be had. My opinion on the matter is most of those things are small and I call it marketing expense. It's good faith for your client as well as any realtor relationship that you have there. Your specific insurance policy is going to have a deductible. So depending on that deductible, it might may or may not make sense. Sorry for the lights going off in my office. Somebody just hit the light. Now I've got to ask her, sorry, I'm waving at her to turn the light back on. It's only six o'clock here and they're already running away. Anyway, um, like if you're if you have general liability policy with me, you've got a thousand dollar deductible. So depending on that, you can send that claim over and you can decide in, in those situations we're just we're mostly following the advice of the client. Even though it's at ultimately it's the insurance carrier's decision. Um, those things we handle both ways, and it's normally the client's opinion on the matter that, that determines that. Anything else? Uh, that's it so far that I see. Yeah, that's the only question so far. Um, okay. Excellent. Well, that, that's the bulk of the presentation, but let me give you this claim sound example, and then this is actually a pre-claim example, and then if we have time, I'll jump to the second one as well. Um, but I call this one, you you know your stuff, bro. This is a this is an inspection in, in Los Angeles, and it's not in the most affluent area of Los Angeles. I think it's probably East LA or, or one of those more scary named towns in California, and this is uh, a client of mine who does a ton of inspections there. The homes there aren't always the best of locations, as you can see. Now, many of you guys looking through these photos already would say, I don't even want to do that inspection. You don't need an inspection. You need a contractor. This particular client does a lot of investor inspections. And in this case, that's, that's what's happened. So they want a home inspection done before the contractor. So he does a, a very good home inspection report, a lengthy inspection report. One of the good things about a home that's this run down is you get to tell them it's got all sorts of problems and they've got to have repairs done and further evaluation on almost every element of the house. The negative is that makes your report long and maybe the value of your inspection less. But we're gonna focus a little bit on the electrical issues. As you can see from his report, and this is just the summary section of the report, he's going to talk about all sorts of different problems with it he talks about fire hazard he talks about um, updating and replacement of the electrical system he talks about the service box being in and the lifespan he goes on to talk about potential electric shock risks and damage receptacles and and all sorts of things okay so in addition to that he did a full inspection report that electrical section of that report included nine pages and had 14 photos. He had several other photos in his own um, records, but the report itself contained 14 photos in just the electrical section. Um, I don't think you have to put that many in there to get your word across, but it's always good. This inspector also communicated very well with this client prior to the inspection. He established some rapport and even maybe uh, a confidence and friendship with this person that allowed him to communicate um, verbally with his report and prior to and after. Uh, the buyers were able to negotiate better terms of the real estate purchase because of his report. And the sellers um, actually still to this day, because this is only about a month old that this inspection happened, the sellers are still fixing issues with the house. While the contractor was fixing the house, this happened. An electrical fire. And it was in the attic. I think this, I don't, I don't know if it was knob and tube or or it may have been. If you can look closely, it looks like there's some evidence of knob and tube up on those rafters. But the contractor actually started a fire during the inspection. So we start to deal with issues um, 
no matter who's responsible, even though he's done a really good job in this inspection, we start to deal with issues where uh, a homeowner insurance or a contractor insurance will start to subrogate against any professional that's been on site. But this is what actually happened in this situation. The client reached out to the inspector via text with this, and this is what makes it kind of fun. Remember what you told us about this is a fire waiting to happen about the electrical in the home my family is buying in LA? The house caught on fire while the seller's contractor was doing repairs on the home. I kid you not, this is before we could close escrow and we now need to wait until the seller repairs the home due to the fire. And then he says, you know your, depending on who I'm speaking with, stuff, bro. Um, kind of a fun story. This is a pre-claim. There's nothing to be done with it right now. But this client made me aware via me noticing his Facebook post. Uh, and then we can start to kind of prepare our file just in case some of that stuff starts to come across the board. Okay, uh, my, my time's kind of up guys, but I wanted to give you some more time to answer questions. Uh, if you have any more questions on insurance, I don't care if they're hard questions, guys, hammer me with the difficult stuff or the stuff that people don't, don't want to hear. Okay, well, Will, uh, I don't have any questions right now, except there was one earlier besides uh, Don's uh, about the garage door operator. Um, it's where, where are you located out of? And I told them Utah, is that right? Yeah, born and raised in Southern Utah. I live in Lehigh, Utah now. My office is in Lehigh as well, which is about 40, 40 minutes south of Salt Lake City Center between Salt Lake and Provo in Northern Utah. Okay, uh, we do have another question here. It's uh, how about a snowy roof and not inspecting it? Any issue with claims? No, you should definitely put that in the report, right? The, the roof was not visible because of the snow. So make sure you cover your bases there. I haven't clients that offer to come back uh, when the weather clears up right in the spring or whatever. I don't think that's necessary, but you need to definitely outline in that report that you were unable to inspect that portion of the home due to whatever the condition is. That could be storage in the basement, storage in the garage, a car blocking the access to the attic, whatever it might be. Just make sure you put that in the report. Okay, uh, and uh, I do have one other question. I'm not sure if this is for you uh, or not, Will. It says, uh, can I unmute my mic reference great experience with Citadel? Um, yes, you can. Uh, oh, no, well, you can't ask a question, guys. That, no, you, 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 you can't talk. This is a, because this is a webinar, it would just be uh, crazy with all the guys on it. So you just have to ask the questions uh, when you type them out. So yeah, you, you would have to enable that, Frank, and you could, um, they might actually be able to just push the mic button unless if you haven't blocked them from doing that and, and unmute themselves. Yeah, well, we'll unfortunately, we, we do have them, everybody's blocked. Uh, they can't do okay. it themselves. Um, but uh, so we just asked them to, uh, and he just said, no problem. He's happy to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled you've had a great experience. <laughs> uh, what's your uh, position on going beyond the scope, Will? Uh, that depends on what that is, right? <laughs> uh, I think there is value. Uh, what, I, what I normally communicate is you have your standards of practice and so you also have your standard of care. And I think at times, um, like for example, many safety issues are well beyond the scope of what your home inspection is. But I think that there's a value and a moral obligation as a home inspector to communicate your, to your client in a way that they know this is a severe issue that needs to be looked at by somebody who isn't handcuffed by your standards, right? Okay, great, thanks. One other thing, uh, I, one comment actually, I give winter discounts for areas I can't inspect. So uh, that's, that's a general, um, you know, that's his approach. And uh, I guess there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you wanna do. No, I'd offer to also a reinspection. Get your get your fee back if, if they want you to come back and get to the area that you couldn't get to. Sounds good. Okay, so Will, I, if you have to leave, that's great. Uh, if you want to stick around, that's good too. But I know we do want to get to Eric. Um, and if there are some more questions that uh, come on about the, the insurance, I'll be happy to either, if you're on, I'll give them to you. Or if not, we can forward them to you uh, in an email. Excellent. Thanks for having me, gentlemen and, and ladies, if there are any. Yep, there are. Help anytime I can. Okay, thanks, Will. Okay, so uh, Eric, I'm going to switch over to you. Uh, in just a second. Get myself on muted here. Oh, you're, you're, I think you're okay. Okay, you are unmuted. Um, okay. And I can see you. I'm, I hope everybody else can. Um, 
Okay, you got it, Eric. So you got the you got the screen, Frank, right? I, I just have just you. Uh, I don't have your screen. Okay. Well, that's kind of important. Yes. So uh, you should go to the control panel and uh, show screen. Let me see. Be on the left. Yes. Okay. Now we don't want to show the. Okay, so now showing up. Uh, chimneys, fireplaces, insurance. And now you should have a photo. Uh, not yet. Okay. So I guess the tip here is, guys, make sure that you always put film in your camera before you take a picture. Okay, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do here, Frank. Well, I've got your, it says chimneys, fireplaces, and insurance. Um, yeah, but that's not on my screen. Ah. My screen is a house on fire. Okay. Um, hmm. Well. No, stop. No one sees your screen. Oh, there you go. Got it. All now. right. Okay. Yeah, you give the old guys enough time and we'll get this <laughs> out. Um, so, so anyway, if you were you were on the electric um, last month, um, you kind of know the the drill here. These are really just photos I've taken over many years, um, and all I try to do is sort of see if you guys are looking at some of the stuff, at least that I look at. Um, and if you are, that's great. And if you're not, well, you might want to consider that. Okay. Um, now, when you think about a, a, a chimney fire um, or a house fire, that's that's pretty that's about as costly as a claim is ever going to get. So you kind of want to be sure when you're looking at fireplaces and chimneys, you're you're kind of um, up to date on on what the standards and what the industry uh, calls for. So I have got a bunch of photos here. Um, now, I am going to kind of go through these pictures pretty quickly. In the upper left corner, you're going to see a little number up here. In this case, it's 10A. So if you see a picture and you want to discuss it, kind of jot down what that number is. And then I can easily come back to it um, when I've gotten through all of these photos. But I really want to see, I want you to see some of these conditions that you should be kind of watching out for. Now, if you're not very familiar with uh, chimneys, fireplaces, you may want to um, kind of bone up on that a little bit. And the best place is the Chimney Safety Institute. Now, the chapter has been, the Great Lakes chapter has been down to um, Indiana outside of um, uh, Indianapolis. And we've gone to their training center, which is drop dead amazing. Um, they will they will um, uh, knock your socks off on what they what they know. Um, and if you can get into one of their seminars, all the better. Um, this is the GLC at one of their training programs. Um, the guys at the Chimney Institute are about the best you'll ever come across. Now, if you ever get a chance to listen in um, on a seminar from um, a couple of guys, Ashy, uh, Ashley Eldridge, um, he's, a, he's a, a no longer training, uh, but you will find um, programs, um, recordings of uh, training seminars he's done. John Pilger, uh, he is super, super to listen to. And then Russ DeMott, he currently is doing a lot of their training. Any of these guys, um, if you ever see anything, a presentation by one of these guys, you want to you want to be on top of that one. OK. Um, get a copy of the NFPA 211. It's not a big book. I think it's around sixty dollars, I think. OK, get that book. That is the Holy Bible. Um, you'll be able to reference that. And um, that's that's going to um, be your. Uh, backstop. If you if you have to prove any point of why you're putting something on the report, this, this is the standard to go by. Okay. Now, Ashy also has training programs online. Um, this one was uh, uh, from Skip Walker. That was done at IW. Um, if you don't know Skip, uh, very good presenter. 
he did a presentation. I don't, this one's 2012. I don't know if the ASHI online training goes back to 2012 or not. They do have one from Skip on 2016. Uh, and again, if you're an ASHI member, um, you can get in. It's a freebie. To, and this one is a, a two hour presentation. Um, and that's where you really get into the nitty gritty of uh, furnace, or not furnaces, but fireplaces and chimneys. Okay. Now, you may not be aware, some of you may not be aware, for um, a level two inspection, which most of us are probably familiar with level two, uh, one, two, and three, but a level two inspection, and this is in the NFPA 211. This is a code, okay? And look at number three here. Um, you do, and, and it says up here, shall be conducted under the sale of a, um, or transfer of uh, the property. I put this in my report when I have a chimney or a fireplace. I put this in my report that the level two um, um, is required by the NFPA. Now, this is the only time I ever reference a code in my inspections. Um, but if anybody has a chimney fire and they want to come back to me, I can come and say, well, did you do the level two like I recommended you do? Okay. I don't, I don't want that monkey on my back. So. Put this in your report um, if you're so inclined to do that. Um, but it is, but it is um, in, in uh, 211 with that. Now, briefly, we'll talk about the manufactured fireplaces. There are going to be clearance requirements here. You can't always do it. This one is up in the attic, looking down onto the uh, manufactured firebox. It doesn't have the proper clearances. Um, again, you can't always do this. Um, but this is actually fairly common to find, okay? In the manufactured fireboxes, this is a sidewall. This is the um, um, room um, of the living room or family room, whatever it was, but you can see how this is cracked. Any cracking, any separation of seams, any warpage, that box has been um, um, overheated. Generally, you're gonna find these manufactured fireboxes maybe 20 years, 25 years, uh, but they don't last forever. Um, and you may, it's like electric panels, you may want to point out to your client that, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's an older uh, box, it may be time to consider changing it out. Now, it's not just changing out the box, you probably have to change out, you likely will have to change out the venting system because it's all rated to go together. So you put in a, a new firebox, it may not be rated, uh, rated for the existing liner. So your costs start really jumping up. So be sure your client understands that possibility, okay? Again- uh, Eric, Eric, one quick question. This is not particular, uh, pertains to a particular photograph, but the question was, is a level two uh, required for venting with B or A vents or just for masonry fireplaces? Uh, the 211 doesn't doesn't make that distinction. They say fireplaces. So if it's manufactured or masonry, it should be done. If that okay. if that's what the question was. Yeah, well, uh, I don't think it's on B vents. B vents, yeah. I, He's got I, I have not heard that about B vents. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, and again. I've seen this where um, the firebox is covered with insulation, um, not much better insulator than air. And that's why they want to have uh, spaces around these uh, the boxes, around the um, blue pipes, um, no contact with um, any uh, combustibles. You don't even want to get your insulation up against the, the fl uh, flue pipe because now it's, tr it's causing that flue pipe to run hotter than it was designed. So you can't always get into this position where you can look down, but I guarantee you, if you can do it, it, it may be well worth the effort with that. Now, you can always go and, not always, but you often can go and check the data plate, the name plate on the firebox, and that'll give you additional information about um, specifications. Um, <clears throat> this one here, it says chimney two inch clearance uh, minimum on that, so, and you can go online and you can look this stuff up um, to get additional information if you want to support something that you might be writing um, for your for your client, okay? Now we all know, I hope, that <clears throat> when you're driving down the street and you see the smoke coming out of the chimneys, it's a water vapor when it's coming off 
a, uh, a, a gas appliance. And of course, this is ice that's up here. This was taken last two years ago, I think. Um, so there can be quite a bit of water uh, here. And you want to be aware um, of problems that they may have had. Now, this is looking at the base of the chimney. We're looking up um, toward the uh, bottom of the uh, flue pipe. And you can see they've got a copper drain line here to remove the water. I don't remember where that water was going, but that's something you might be wanting to check out. It's, do we have a, an issue with condensation in the chimney? And it happens quite a bit. This one here, we're looking through what they call the thimble, where a uh, uh, chimney connector from a furnace would connect into the terracotta tile, and you can see the water that's running down in here. I don't remember how I got this picture, um, but it's it's a good representative one. Um, you will sometimes see where water's been running down from the ash clean out and running down onto the floor. Yes, there's a lot of water that can be developing in these chimneys and it causes problems. This one here, the moisture in the chimney has wicked out into the sidewall. And you can see in here, the mortar joints are all deteriorated and it's come out geez, four or five feet. It can cause a lot of damage and you want to know, try to figure out why, well, you don't have to figure out, you have to be aware that they've got some moisture issues. This house was in Dundee. This was yet several years ago. Uh, this is an orphaned water heater. And you can tell it's, it's causing that chimney just to be soaked. And as I remember, the interior walls were wet um, because the, um, uh, flue liner was now too big for that orphaned water heater. This is uh, looking through the ash cleanout at the base of the chimney. We're looking up um, and we've got our terracotta liner in here and you can see the moisture that's been generating here. Now there's a couple of things here. Number one, the moisture, <clears throat> but the, the bottom of this flue liner should be sealed up. We don't want to be pulling air up through the base of this liner. We wanna be pulling all the air up through the chimney connector. And there's a differentiation between a vent connector and a chimney connector, if you really want to get into the technology. This would be a uh, chimney connector because it's, it's, it's connecting into an actual chimney rather than um, uh, like a B vent that you would have for the furnace, okay? So you don't want this open here, but again, this is a great indication of the water that we have had uh, in this particular chimney. So when you have a chance, you may want to try to take a look at some of these areas here. Uh, transite, um, nothing wrong with transite, as long as it's intact, it's not damaged, uh, but another moisture issue. Now, it could be, um, it could be a proper, improperly sized and oversized flue liner. Um, it could be a burner adjustment. It could be a short cycling burner. And again, that's getting into heating systems, but this can be a cause of condensation. Um, so don't say, um, yeah, the, the flu is too big. Don't say, you know, it's this or that. Just say, it could be this, it could be that. You better get somebody qualified out here to um, take a look at it and figure out what's going on. In my experience, whoever they get out there doesn't know what they're doing, but that's not my problem, okay? More moisture issues. Um, there's something going on with this chimney. This one, I don't remember what it was, but it certainly is telling me I've got some problems. And you, see, you can see here, once we start getting above the conditioned areas of the home, that chimney is not staying very warm anymore. And we start getting condensation um, up inside the chimney. And the chimney is very porous. So if you have, moisture in that flue liner, it's going to wick out um, into the rest of the structure unless you get a metal liner um, in there. So another example, we get above the roof line and it's off to the races. Um, this was kind of cute. I don't remember how old this picture is, um, but on some of the older houses, you kind of want to, when you get down in the basement, okay, check to see how the chimney is supported. <laughs> this one I just thought was weird. I can't explain it. It was looking inside the ash cleanout in the um, um, ash pit and looking up 
at the underside of the fireplace firebox. I have no idea how they did that, but that is the underside of the firebox. Again, I wouldn't have seen it if I didn't look in through the hatch clean out. And that's easy to do. Just reach in there with your camera, point it up, take a picture and see what you got, okay? This is another one. This house they moved and they forgot to re-support the chimney. I did not spend much time underneath that thing. Um, <laughs> movement, watch for movement. You'll see that on the outside. Um, okay, this one's, I think I jumped here. Uh, this one is the most extreme I have seen. I'm gonna say we, they've got a real creosote problem in there. Um, I don't know if it's, I can't remember if it's ever been cleaned, but this is the most extreme I have ever seen um, with that. Um, check if you can do it. I recommend when you're on the roof, if it's safe, if you're comfortable with it, um, try to look down inside the uh, flue liner. Now get your terminology straight. The space in here is the flue. This is the flue liner. They're not the same. The flu is a space. Um, so again, terminology is kind of important. Um, this one here, I can see a crack right in here. And it's just looking down from the top of the chimney. Sometimes looking up from the bottom, you will find a crack. And then also I can see offsetting here. Okay. What the Chimney Safety Institute will say is that this chimney cannot contain products of combustion. That is their wording with that. And I often will use that in uh, my report. And so what I indicate, um, I indicate a level two, get somebody in here to check it all out. They run a camera in here. They're gonna see all these joints. They're gonna see if the mortar has eroded. Uh, they'll see this offsetting. Um, and sometimes they've gotta clean it just to see if there are any cracks. But again, and a lot of guys don't wanna take off those flu caps. And I understand that I take them off. If I can get up there, I wanna look down inside whenever I can, okay? Um, this one again, um, I can't remember if I'm looking, I might be looking up from the firebox here, um, but this is the new metal liner in here. All of this in here needs to be sealed. No gaps, if you please. Um, any gaps in there uh, cannot contain products of combustion. Obviously, we've got a creosote problem in here. Now, they clean it all up and they find other problems. Well, that's that's always a possibility. Don't let your client believe if they clean it, they'll be good to go. Tell them to get a thorough safety inspection with that, okay? Here's a metal liner. Um, this was from the roof looking down. It needs to be run up to the top of the chimney um, before it's terminated. Um, generally what they will do um, is they'll put an insulation insulator, a sleeve over this for the entire length to help um, avoid that um, uh, condensation. I can't remember what angle I took this picture from, but again, Take a little time, and you may not be able to visually get into in to see something, but you can get your camera in there, and and just doing that will tell you a lot of information. And right here, I got a safety problem. I've probably got too much corrosion here. I'm going to guess this is not salvageable. So they're going to be looking at reventing all of this. Okay, um, watch for any cracking on the um, chimney. Um, this one is a kind of blurry picture. But this chimney showed signs of pulling away from the house in here, just from the caulking, okay? In the firebox, same fireplace, same chimney, I had more signs of any movement, okay? Um, some of you guys might be familiar with Lindemann Chimney Service. Um, they're in the north suburbs. Um, they said this was okay. I don't recommend them anymore, okay? Um, here's my uh, manufactured firebox. Here's my uh, living room or whatever it is. And they built this wall out and they kind of framed it in with two by fours. No, obviously not, okay? Um, even if this was masonry, these joints have gotta be mortared. They gotta be fully sealed. Any separations, um, it's, it's a safety concern, okay? Um, here, the firebox is on this side. Now I've got my wood framing. So 
stick your head in there and look up um, here and see what you can see. Uh, any gaps between the um, uh, brick and the uh, lintel, no good. Um, again, doesn't contain products of combustion. So I know you're kind of being anal by doing this, but remember, if that house burns down, that's a call you are definitely not want to going to get want to get. Okay, the hearth extension here. Watch these things. Um, let me see if I can enlarge this a little bit, because this one was kind of a good example. Plywood right underneath. So a log rolls out. That heat is going to transfer into the combustible subfloor. You got a problem. Now I've heard different um, opinions on how deep the um, uh, hearth extension should be with a non-combustible. And a lot of times with the manufactured fireboxes, it'll go back to the what the manufacturer states. Um, I've seen some specifications that I thought were um, kind of wimpy. Um, I didn't agree with them. Um, but watch for this. If, if, you're, if it's suspect that it may have um, a combustible material underneath, um, you might want to advise for uh, um, some follow-up. Also, again, the, uh, the uh, hearth extension where it comes up to the firebox, no gaps. You shouldn't see, you shouldn't be able to see anything down into the subfloor. Any ashes or um, embers get in there, bad day. Okay, obviously this is this is wrong. They've got the gap in here. This is just a problem waiting to happen. Okay. Uh, okay, looking in through the ash cleanout, looking up with the camera. Um, really, you don't want to have any um, wood in here. This is underneath the firebox of the fireplace. That should all be non combustible. There is a way um, to get in there, it ain't pretty. Um, they can break out part of the wall um, down in the basement to get in there, and then they have to break out all that wood. Um, the other option may be is um, for the um, uh, clean out here is to seal it up and, and mortar it. Um, that I've heard is sometimes another option rather than trying to get in, into here and, and, and remove all that wood. But you will find that quite a bit. Uh, again, another example of that. All right, we've got our um, brick here. Here's the opening to the fireplace. We've got our brick here and we've got our lintel, okay? This lintel is way too low, okay? Most likely this fireplace is gonna have problems drafting out into the room. Um, technically, <clears throat> you should not be seeing much of anything for the uh, damper handle. That should be recessed up, uh, up above uh, here. I know you guys really don't get into this. I had the picture and I threw it in. Um, this is a burner in a uh, fireplace. Um, and I actually have found this quite a bit. I will check for gas flow. I don't really light the burners, uh, but sometimes I have, if it sounds like the, the uh, uh, pressure is pretty high for the gas flow. Uh, this one, the pressure is too high because the flames are lifted off the, um, off the burner bar. Um, I had one where the flames were actually coming out of the uh, firebox. I, it was wonderful. I wanted to get a picture, but I didn't want to have a reason for the fire department to come by. Now, here are your details here. You've got your um, angle iron. You've got the base of your, um, uh, dam your uh, damper throat here and your eight inch. Now, don't go in there with the tape measure and, oh, it's seven and a half inches. Come on, it's, it's, if they're close. Uh, but the idea is let's get a little distance in here um, so we can encourage that smoke to go up and into um, the smoke chamber. Okay. Now you probably have heard of these logs that you will put in and to help burn the creosote. And I have heard that they work quite well. The problem is the creosote that lines the flue liner then drops down to the floor of the smoke chamber. And then that starts to interrupt with the operation of the uh, damper. So if you're gonna use those logs, you're still gonna have to clean it out. So why not just get a certified chimney sweep to come and do it right the first time? That's my opinion. Um, little bit of a technology or a technical um, point of view. Um, this is the hearth and this is the hearth extension. And again, just terminology uh, with that. 
Okay, again, um, a little bit more in the um, terminology here. Um, I, believe, I believe in using uh, uh, the terminology. Um, I don't expect my clients to understand it, but I try to show in the report if I'm talking about a smoke chamber or whatever, I usually will put a diagram like this in there so they can reference it and see what it is. But you ought to have a handle on what these terms are. NFPA 211, um, that's gonna show you some details about clearances. You've got your surround here for combustibles and they're gonna tell you um, if this is coming out, um, if, if the, sur the combustible surround is coming out so far, you you're either gonna have a six inch clearance or a 12 inch clearance, okay? Um, surrounds, I believe that surrounds are in the um, ASHE standard or the Illinois standard, they're somewhere. Um, so I wouldn't say that I'm not responsible for that. No, you are kind of responsible for that, okay? Also the 211 will show you the um, depth of the hearth extension based upon the size of the opening into the firebox. So again, you maybe wanna be aware of this a little bit, okay? Um, sometimes that, that, that clearance isn't there. Uh, uh, well, this one's a no brainer. Um, they're trying to control um, smoke that's rolling out. I don't think I would have used that material, um, but they've, got, they've had a problem with um, drafting. Anytime I see soot up here, it's going on the report. I don't know if it's been repaired or corrected or looked at or anything. I make a notation of it and I suggest it probably should be figured out. But this, this one here, yeah, this is, yeah, we're not gonna use, don't use that thing and tell people, don't use this until proper repairs have been made, okay? Um, I've heard different stories on these gas valves in the uh, firebox. Um, I don't like it. Um, I, I think it should be re relocated. Um, whether there are some allowances for it, I don't really care. Um, the state of Illinois lets me report on my opinion and I think it's stupid. So I tell people it's probably best to relocate it, okay? Uh, watch your damper throat. This is the damper throat. Um, any damage in here? Now, you may have seen some of these uh, uh, dampers they will put on the top of the flue, up on the top of the chimney. And then what they will do is they will take the damper out. They don't take the frame out, but they will remove the damper plate and take it away. So you won't even have it. And then you'll have a little um, aircraft cab cable coming down through the flue. Um, and you'll hook it onto the side of the firebox, and that's where you can open your spring-loaded um, uh, flue top damper. Um, and those can actually work quite well, especially if this is if you have an outside wall chimney versus an interior chimney. Okay, the Chimney Safety Institute, um, those certified members, I have never met a certified chimney sweep through the Chimney Safety Institute that didn't know his stuff, okay? They don't go along with this corbelled brick. They don't like open brick cores and they don't like this stair-stepped brick. They want this all parged. Um, and yes, we see this all the time, but really you don't want one of these guys coming in behind you and pointing this out because they're gonna be right and you're gonna be wrong. Um, so I used to, I've always pointed out the brick cores. I used to not get, excited if the parging um, wasn't there, but you know, a couple of trips down to the Ch Chimney Safety Institute changed my tune on that one. And I wanna be on the same um, um, uh, uh, water level as those guys are. So they don't like it, they, they say it's a problem, I'm gonna say it's a problem, okay? Again, when you can, look down the flue liner, see if you can see any problems, cer certainly some significant um, uh, offsetting here. Um, we are also mixing uh, terracotta with metal liners. No go. You don't mix. It's got to be the same material all the way up. We see this quite a bit. Um, again, more problems um, up on the roof. Um, a lot of corrosion in here. Don't monkey with it. Tell them you're probably going to be looking at some money to replace all of this. Now, sometimes I will, a lot of times I will say, I don't know the extent of the condition. And I don't want people to think it's only the spot where I had the picture. 
I want to know that there's a possibility it can go further than that. Again, looking down the chimney, actually I had my um, chimney, um, I had a level two inspection on my chimney a couple of years ago, and um, I, I thought I was in pretty good shape, and this is exactly what they, they found in here. They had stuffed in some brick to um, bridge the gap between two terracotta liners, okay? Um, this was a house, uh, this was a ranch. They added on a second floor, and so they wanted to extend up the uh, chimney. Now, this, I don't know what this is. I, I don't care. That wasn't my issue. My issue was we went from masonry to metal. No, it doesn't work. There is no approved connector to go from masonry to metal. So it's it's not approved. So don't get caught in that one. Again, the NFPA is not it's not going to side with you on this one. So this one was a problem. Um, I don't know what they did with it, um, but it was a no-go. Okay. So when we have a lot of problems with our flu liners, we think we'll run another liner down in there. Well, that's all good and go to go, but that liner is going to be dependent on what that chimney is servicing. So it'd be the size of the firebox, it'd be the size of the furnace, the water heater, whatever that uh, flu is servicing is going to dictate how large that metal liner has to be. Now, if the metal liner has got to be larger and it's going to, then this flu liner will accept, this all has to be broken out and your, your cost goes through the roof once they have to do that. So don't just tell them, yeah, we'll just install a flu liner because that may not be that simple. You, you want to watch out for the possibility the existing liner has to be broken out. And that's a vicious job for the guy to do it. Um, again, more pictures here, uh, cracking, separation, um, offsetting here. Um, again, you're not going to see it unless you can get to the top of the chimney, and we can't get to the top of the chimney a lot of the time. And I've probably missed some of these because I couldn't get on the chimney or I didn't have the nerve to get up there. Um, this was kind of weird. Um, no good. Um, these are not rated to go onto these uh, uh, flue pipes. Uh, now here's a, a metal liner. Uh, coming in. I used to tell my clients a metal liner, a uh, stainless steel my, uh, liner is going to be about $1,000. Well, then I put in a, a more recent furnace about five years ago, a newer furnace, and we had to um, put in a metal liner. Well, it was $2,000. So I was I was way off. So every all my clients up to that point, I was telling them $1,000. That was, I, I was way off with that. Technically, um, this liner here, should be supported, and it was not. This is looking up from the firebox, um, from the fireplace, and again, I'm able to get um, a crack. I've got some offsetting in here, so again, this is going to be um, evaluation by a, uh, a certified chimney sweep. Okay, we see this all the time: the mortar wash. Of course, it cracks. Water gets in here. We all know what happens with the spalling. Okay. I almost never see a proper sealant between the, the wash and the um, uh, liner um, here. So um, you don't even you don't even have to get on the roof to see this. You, you can tell that this doesn't have an overhang. You can tell this is wrong. You don't need a drone. You don't need anything. You just look at it from the ground and say, nope, that's wrong. Um, this, you'd have to see if you're up there. Um, I don't know what this was for. That was a weird one. They might have used this to support the vent as they were installing it. I don't know. Um, but that's certainly a source of water entry. Again, the mortar wash, this is the problem. Water comes off the wash and it goes back in between the wash and the brick. And then we get our freeze thaw cycles. And it's a slow process, but it really has an effect on a chimney. So what you want to do is you want to watch for this overhang here, okay? You've got the proper joint in here um, and you're trying, you're keeping that water um, and they'll put a, a, a fabric in here to separate the top course of brick from the um, uh, uh, crown. Well, I don't usually see that and I don't put that on my report. I figure I'm lucky if I can, if I can get this detail, but this is what you see with the mortar wash um, with that. 
Okay. Um, for your, this is your storm collar. Make sure they caulk around here. That's a water intrusion point. That's easy to do. Here underneath the um, uh, uh, chimney cap, this is going to come in. And when it gets up to the flue liner, it's going to lip up just a little bit. So don't worry about water getting underneath here. It's, it's not going to happen. But up here, yeah, it can get in there. Um, uh, this happens a lot. You see quite a bit of rusting on these things, and you're not on the roof. You better assume um, that all emotional bonds should be broken with this um, chimney housing here. Um, whatever this used to be to, um, probably wasn't what came with this chimney housing. So again, um, wrong. Um, I don't see too much in the way of these uh, wood-burning stoves, um, <clears throat> such as this one. Um, the newer ones will have a, a specification plate on the box of the on the back of the firebox. Um, I can't remember if there was one on this one or not. Would have been hard to see, but that's where all your specifications are for your clearances. It'd be the clearances uh, to the uh, uh, floor uh, combustibles, to the adjoining walls, um, clearances for the um, um, vent to the surrounding walls. If if those clearances are not listed on the firebox, it's probably an older um, firebox, and then you revert to the NFPA 211. And this is going to tell you what those clearances need to be. And when you look at this, you're going to say, well, who in the world's going to put their firebox, their, their box out 36 inches from the wall? You know what? It's, it's, what's the, it's what the 211 says. Um, so if the if the firebox doesn't have those specifications, you go to the 211 and um, and I use this diagram um, a lot um, for my reports. Okay, um, I don't know how many of you guys will see this in the really old homes. Some guys want to see it and they want to throw up. Okay, actually, this is okay. You're not going to see any movement with these things. They've been there for you know many decades. They generally, I rarely have seen where they have moved. So it looks really off the wall, um, but it's okay. The question might be as far as a flu liner being inside. That would be the only question I would have with something like this. This was a house that's kind of funny. This is a house I was in and um, the, the, the people had a picture of their kids up on the wall. The kids I didn't care about. The fireplace on the other hand, you know, they're, they're <laughs> That's over firing. They're they're doing some damage to that fireplace. Um, so you want to watch for signs of overheating um, and damage that can result from that. Okay, and then watch your clearances um, um, for the roof. Um, you probably already know what these are, um, but you want to watch for these clearances. Okay, um, this is courtesy of uh, Todd Arnold. I think this was his picture, so I'll give him credit. Um, this one's a little bit low, and that one's kind of high. Um, I can't remember if I took this picture or not, but I thought that was that was pretty wild. Um, whether they have condensation issues with that one, I have no idea. That was a neighbor's house. So, and those are the pictures. I kind of rushed through them, um, but um, I did I did want to um, um, get through them so you could kind of see what we had here. Um, actually, a lot of these pictures. When I, I'm, I have to apologize. What I did is I kind of showed a full picture and that number was not up in the corner there for these larger um, pictures here. But if you have a question, we can backtrack and see if we can uh, find what you might have been talking about. So Frank, that's what I've got. Okay, well, we've got a, a few questions, Eric, thanks. Um, Do I have to have you, answers? Uh, well, you make one up, it doesn't matter. Okay, all um, right, I'm good with that. All right, go ahead. <laughs> okay, if the clay liner, uh, if the clay is the flu liner, what do you call a metal insert to alleviate the problem of an orphan water heater? Two part question. So could you briefly explain what an orphan water heater is? Maybe some guys don't know. Yes, okay. Um, all right, if you have uh, an older house, you will have a furnace and the water heater um, going um, into the chimney. And let me go back and- 34, I think it was. Okay, I wanna go. Yeah, well, this will tell you the, the orphaned water heater here, um, but I wanted to go back with that picture. Let me see if I can find it. This one. 
look at the moisture that's coming off of that um, uh, that vent. Okay, so I tell my clients when you're driving down the street and you see the smoke coming out of the chimney, and they say, "Yeah, we see it all the time." I said, "It's not smoke; it's a water vapor." So if that blue liner, whether it's um, masonry or it's metal, um, if it doesn't stay warm enough, it's going to be like a glass of ice water on a humid day. And my clients always understand that. What happens to glass? Condensation. Right. So if my water vapor is going up my chimney and that chimney doesn't stay warm enough, I'm going to start to have condensation. Okay. Well, the idea is, is when I have a water heater and a furnace sharing that same flu, that flu is likely to stay warmer. Okay. When we take the um, older furnace out and we drop in a newer one, um, you're going to change the um, conditions inside that liner. It may not stay as warm anymore because we're not sending as much heat up that that um, uh, up that flue. Now I remember back from 1991, um, Northern Illinois Gas, which is now NICOR, they were advising people if they were going to put in new heating equipment, they would probably want to put in a new liner. Okay. Um, and that's still the advice, because if you take out, if you put in, when I told you I had replaced our flu liner, we put in a more, we put in a mid-efficiency furnace. It was more efficient than the one we took out. So we changed the um, conditions in the uh, flu liner because I wasn't sending as much heat up there. So we have condensation. Now, orphaned water heater is when you will take your, furnace out of the picture and you put in a high efficiency um, or what they'll call a condensing furnace. They, they condense um, um, water vapor by, the, by their very nature, okay? And they'll vent that out through the sidewall. Well, that leaves only our water heater and that's why they call it an orphaned water heater. So what happens is you're very likely to start having condensation issues um, in that um, venting system, whether it's metal, or it's um, uh, brick, and that's where you would want to probably have to go and put in a smaller metal liner. Um, and the idea is, is because the diameter of that liner is smaller, it stays warm better. And if it stays warm, we're not likely to have that condensation form. Now, the problem is you got these Billy Bob heating contractors who are trying to bid against each other and nobody wants to talk about putting in a new liner because once you do that, you're not competitive with the other Billy Bob contractors who are not going to tell the client about putting in a new liner. So they, it's rarely done. But when you see this condensation, that's like some of the pictures we have shown, um, it could be um, that the flu liner is um, improperly sized. And again, it could also be um, the burners are out of adjustment. It could be the burners are short cycling. There can be different reasons for it. Don't lead your client into what it could be, okay? Now, in my house, I'm kind of anal about my house. And when we put in a metal liner, I didn't want it showing. We have a masonry, a three flue uh, masonry chimney. And I did not want a metal liner um, extending up um, above the terracotta tile. I didn't want to see it. Um, you can talk to my wife, she can tell you how particular I can be. So if you looked at my house, you would say, there's no metal liner. No, there is a metal liner, but it's not visible. It's not visible down the basement and it's not visible on the top of the chimney. So if you don't see a metal liner, just say it's not evident. Don't say Great. it's not there, don't say it is there, raise a question. And say, you may wanna check with the homeowner, see if they install it or you have a qualified um, Heating contractor. Heating contractors generally are not trained for venting systems. So kind of keep that in mind. There have been a couple of times for venting of heating equipment, I've recommended a certified chimney sweep because those guys know how to do it. Of course, nobody really follows you. They think, well, that must be a typo. You know, he didn't mean a chimney guy, you know, uh, for the water heater or for the furnace. Um, but that would be the um, most qualified person to do it. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, next question is, I think it was uh, photo number 36, uh, the transite. Uh, could you explain uh, what that is? And I know you mentioned that it uh, looks like it's in pretty good shape, but you didn't. It uh, does, it, yeah, yeah. It's well, transite. Is transite is um, an asbestos material. 
Okay, so people hear asbestos, they hear mold, and they're going to panic and they want to run out of the neighborhood. Okay, transite is fine if it's in good condition. This is in good condition, and it usually is. I rarely see transite uh, for a, um, uh, a chimney liner having a problem. Um, on my report, I indicate what type of chimney, and here I would say transite, but I don't make an issue of it. I would indicate the water staining. Now, I don't know if the water staining is going to cause any problem. I don't, I wouldn't expect it to. But again, we do know that this water can drain down. You guys have probably seen it. It drains down and comes into the um, chimney connector and down into the furnace, down into the blower compartment. And that's really corrosive um, uh, water that's in there. You don't want that draining back down. It, it eats out um, the uh, mortar in a uh, masonry chimney it wreaks havoc with your b vents so you don't really want any condensation uh, so again you always want to address it but this one as far as the transite it's not a problem as long as it's not coming and i've only seen a couple that were kind of someone hit up against it and it was kind of broken well now it's a problem it's kind of like your floor tiles if if the floor tiles um, are in good shape and it's an older home it's likely going to have asbestos in it, but if it's in good condition, they say, leave it alone. And it's gonna be the same thing with these with these um, flue pipes uh, that you'll see. You won't see a lot of them, um, but this is what they look like. Okay, great, thanks, Eric. Um, next question is, uh, what is what is the rule for burning wood in a fireplace with a gas starter? Well, all right, read that again. Uh, the rule for... Rule what is the rule for using uh, wood in a fireplace with a gas starter? Well, all right, so you, you can have a starter for a uh, ceramic log set, um, and that's going to be a different animal. That picture I showed you of the burner bar where the flame was up a little bit off of it, that's what you would use for a uh, wood burning fireplace. Now, to be totally honest, um, I might be a little bit fuzzy on whether or not um, all vented uh, uh, manufactured fireboxes uh, with your, your uh, flue pipes. Um, I'm not sure if some of those have restrictions where they're um, uh, gas only. That I'm a little fuzzy on. I hate, I hate to admit it, but I am um, with that. But there are two different burners um, depending on how you're going to use it. So if you have a, um, um, uh, a log set in there, um, a ceramic log set, and you want to use wood burning, you got to take that log set out, you got to take the burner assembly out, and you got to put in a, de a, a burner bar for that particular purpose. Okay, great. Uh, next question was, uh, can we get a copy of the 211 diagram? Um, so, um, yeah, I can send that to you. Um, well, and guys, here, let me let me just say this, guys. This is recorded, so uh, you know we'll send you a link, and you can always go back to this, so you can uh, you'll be yeah, able to see that uh, photograph uh, yeah. uh, from there. And that's and that that one. Um, um, actually, I copied that out of my uh, um, 2006 <laughs> to 11. So I know I don't have the most current ver version, but the one I've got is the one I use, and it's obviously. 14 years old, but it's, I still use it because the information is still correct. And re related to that, Eric, uh, the question is, can we just refer the client to a certified chimney sweep for further evaluation to prevent a fireplace hazard? Well, again, <laughs> that's what the 211 says. Why not say it? Sure. You know, I, I, it's as I said, in my report, whenever I've got a fireplace, that comment about the 211 and all home, all fireplaces in, in part of a, a real estate transaction, they should have the um, uh, level two. Okay. And, and that, like I said, that takes the monkey off your back. Right. Okay, because next that, one, that, yeah. this is kind of, kind of related to that gas uh, line, the uh, gas insert pipe. I see the penetration not sealed. Uh, don't they need a high temperature sealant to prevent the flame from seeking yep. air inside the chimney? And why do I see this so often? Uh, you see it so often because the same reason I see it so often. Um, I don't know if it's so much of an issue with gas log. I don't. I still point it out because you know they could take the log set out and use that for wood burning. But yes, it's supposed to have a high temperature sealant around that um, gas line, 
and I always take a picture of it and I point it out every time and I see it a lot. Okay. Um, one thing, uh, and this this was uh, just something that I, I learned a long time ago, Eric, and maybe you've heard it too, maybe some other guys have, but uh, if you have a, a little hairline crack in the in the uh, mortar in the in the fireplace, uh, 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 if you could put a nickel in there in the space, that's way too too big of a gap. Uh, have yes. you heard anything about that? Is that one of the things that uh, you've learned too? Yep, yep. And I've heard that more than once. And I didn't cover that here, but you've got those three refractory panels um, in the firebox there. And as you said, Frank, they do allow for some hairline cracks. If you have the nickel test, if that crack is wide enough for a nickel, time for it to be replaced. Um, or if it's in two separate pieces, which I guess would be qualify as a gap of a, for a nickel, um, they should be repeat, be replaced. And as I understand it, you buy that as a set. You don't buy an individual panel um, hmm. with that. So you look. Sometimes you'll see on the back wall, uh, the back panel, you'll see it. What looks like the the, the, the um, surface has spalled off, and you see the um, wire mesh that's embedded into the into the panel um that's that's been overheated um and anytime you see evidence of overheating uh recommend a a, a, a certified chimney sweep and again um, i always say a, a, a chimney safety to safety institute sweep they usually don't get one of those guys but um they, they can't come back to me okay. if they didn't follow that advice okay well great uh those are all the questions we've got unless anybody else has any um, so, Eric, I want to thank you, and uh, also no, Will. I think Will might st still be on if anybody has any questions, insurance questions. Uh, but one thing I did want to say too is uh, next month uh, we're trying to line up uh, an electric water heater speaker, uh, and I want to know. Get, give me your replies back, guys. You don't have to do it now, but uh, do you like the the format of having a vendor speak a little bit before to kind of that's related to the home inspection profession, um, as well as the technical. Uh, part of the uh, presentation. Uh, we're trying to make it as you know easy to digest. We don't want to drag this out very long, but I think uh, Will did a great job, and I think we've got another uh, ISN is lined up for next month. Um, so uh, um, hopefully uh, that, that you guys are okay with that. Um, but unless anybody has any, oh wait, let's see. Okay, uh, no, let's see. Uh, oh, great job, Eric, and uh, both presentations were. Uh, we're great, uh, thanks, and uh, the format is good. Um, how about a seminar on engineered wood? Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, that was rich. Uh, I'll uh, I'll keep that in mind. Okay, uh, and feel free anytime, guys. If you have a, a particular interest, uh, send it to me. Email me. That's the best way to contact me. And um, otherwise, I think we're all set. Um, Eric again, and Will. Uh, thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. You did Glad a great job. Do. Yeah. And um, we'll talk to you guys later. Good night, everybody. Hey, good night.